The only way to know how that's working for you is if you test your body fat percentage weekly, gauge your process on a weekly basis, then you know what levers to pull, right? Then you know if the calories are too high. Ooh, I gained muscle, but I also gained body fat. So let me drop the calories a little bit. This is a touchy process every single week because if you are building muscle and burning body fat, metabolism is changing, meaning your diet has to change uh, as well. So this was the rule that I came up for myself. It was, I tested every week, I took pictures every week. Same time, same day, fr Fridays, first thing in the morning, always. But I would not adjust anything in my programming until two weeks. Because I think the biggest mistake that people make when you're trying to do something in the, like, like the Goldilocks zone is to make a, a decision too soon. If you're, if you're kind of stalled and you're not seeing the progress you'd like to see, what I found more often than not was trusting that process and staying right there for another two weeks. The next two weeks I made big leaps. All right, in today's episode, we're gonna talk about the Goldilocks zone, the very, very difficult and challenging, but possible strategy of building muscle and burning body fat at the same time. Now, again, I want to be very clear. This is very, very challenging and hard to do, but it is possible if you do it the right way. Is it is the Goldilocks zone a real thing? Is that like a real thing for this? Like a no, term? No, or is that I like think, a general term that you yes. use? Okay. Yeah. You know what they use it for? for say I've heard it's that like before. the sweet spot. You know, yeah. like they use it uh, for habitable planets. Right? Yeah. They use it for things <laughs> like that, where it's like you have to have all of the stars aligned perfectly in order to foster this kind of an environment. Yeah. Is so that like the Earth is in the Goldilocks zone. Yeah. So, and, okay. So, uh, do you know the origin of it, Doug? You know the Goldilocks story. Yep. Okay. So the the three bears, right? Yeah. yeah. They had the porridge too porridge hot, too, too hot, cold, too and cold. just right. Everything just right. The just right is the yep. Goldilocks. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah. Learn something new every day. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Dude. You know what I'm yeah. saying? But okay, yeah, we're done. <laughs> That's it. We're done. <laughs> so you learn something. It's your today. nugget. We're today. out. <laughs> yeah. So you know, with something like this, like you know, um, most people want to build muscle. Most people want to burn fat, right? But doing them at the same time. Oh, and by the way, we almost never recommend that people try to do this. It's it's, it's a it's a probably a, a more winning strategy or consistent winning strategy to focus on one uh, at a time. I used to actually tell people like this just isn't something you should focus on. Yeah. Like, this just isn't, um, I wouldn't say it's like impossible, but it's just so difficult. You'd have to know like they're the right person to even approach this. Okay. Now you guys say that. And I agree, like I, especially on this podcast, I would not give this general advice to the, the tons of people that are listening, but if you're if you're advanced and you you've been doing this for a long time, <laughs> this is where you want to get. Like yeah. I think you want to yep. get no matter what, right? No matter what, if your goal is at the time to build more muscle or is to lean out, like when you are, and let's say you fell off the wagon over the holidays and you're getting back, this is this is the ideal way to start to get back in shape because technically it's the fastest way. Oh yeah. I mean, you're doing both at the same time. You did this when you did your big transformation years yes. ago. Yes. Your body weight stayed this. People don't know this. If you saw your before and after picture, which how long ago was that? Was that like 10 years ago? Oh yeah. It's been almost that. It's been almost, God, almost it's been, 10 years. Yeah, right? yeah. Yeah. Close to that. If you look at years. your before and after picture, I mean, you look radically different, the same body weight. Yeah. Same body weight on both of them. I mean, and through the whole process, that, and that was the goal, like when I set out, right? I wanted to show people that you you don't need to see the scale really move that much to radically change your body composition. And I don't think I ever moved more than three to five pounds during that time, like give or take. Only like two, two, two ten, two ten. Uh, I'll look. I actually have. I know I have the picture somewhere where I think I even screenshotted the weight and everything on there. It was I think somewhere between two thirteen and two eighteen. Okay. So it was under two twenty. I was over over 205, 210 range. And your body fat percentage was- uh, Oh, God. I was at 19.7. Okay. And I went all the way down to 7%. Right. So obviously radically different. So muscle up, fat down, body weight stays the same. Yep. Um, and muscle obviously looks very different. But a great experiment because fat. the average person thought I was like, you know, weight wise, radically different. Yes. I mean, if you looked at it, it'd be like, oh, he's got to be way different yeah. body weight wise, yeah. but not at all. Yeah. One of the reasons why this is so hard is because losing fat means that you are in a calorie deficit, meaning that your body is now tapping into its stored energy to make up the difference. So if you're eating, you know, 2000 calories, but you're burning 2,500 calories, well, you, you got to find that extra 500 calories from somewhere. So it's coming from fat, but building muscle, okay, means that you have to have adequate calories to add new tissue. 
So on the one hand, you have to eat le uh, low enough to where your body's tapping into tissue. But then on the other hand, you have to eat enough to feed muscle growth. So it sounds almost like they're opposing. Right. And yet, and in some ways they are opposing. Um, the, the idea basically is to burn fat for energy and use food for muscle. That's really what you're trying to do. Now it's going to get, it's more complex than that. We'll get into it. But I think it's important to note that this is a slow, gradual process. Well, now, and like from a uh, mechanistic point, what is happening? Is it that it's not like both are happening at the same time? It's that in, let's say, a 24 or 48 hour period, there's moments where you're catabolic. There's moments when you're anabolic. Is that how you would describe what's probably really going on? Like when you are keeping it really close calorie wise of what your body needs, there's moments where you probably dip in your body's in a deficit. And then there's moments when you dip in or you are in a slight surplus. Yeah. And so in those moments, the body's in the surplus, your body's repairing and building and adapting to muscle. The moments and times where it's not, and it's in a deficit, it's catabolic, it's burning and it's utilizing mainly body fat. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of how the body works anyway. Right. It's never like the same. It's always building and losing. And if you gain weight, it means it's you're gaining more than you're losing. And then, and vice versa. Um, so it's always kind of doing that, but you know, really this is about signaling. It's okay. If I'm burning 2,500 calories, but I'm taking in 2000 calories and part of the burn of the 2,500 calories is that I'm utilizing, I don't know, let's say 75 calories to add new muscle. Then what I'm hoping is that my body fat is being added to the food that I'm eating to provide these nutrients. So you're getting this kind of transfer, if you will. And now you're not turning fat into muscle. So I want to be very clear, the two totally separate tissues. Right. But you want to basically fuel yourself enough, but then use the extra fat also as part of that. And then simultaneously, you're building muscle, which then affects your metabolism, which is why you know one of the steps we're going to talk about is really tracking what's going on. Because if you are gaining muscle and burning body fat, that means your caloric requirements change. So muscle burns more calories. And so you can't stay the same the whole time. That's the most challenging part about yeah. this is it, it's like, if it, Oh, it worked for the, for this two weeks. It ain't going to work for the next two weeks because now you have Your more body muscle. adapts. Yeah. yeah. It, too. That's why this is such a gradual process because you want to build, but you don't want to build too quickly because you want to be able to distinguish between what type of tissue you're actually totally. um, building or, or if you're that spillover becomes storage, which becomes fat. And then now we have to kind of like uh, account for that. And yeah. the reason why you guys would never recommend this uh, to most, most people is because more than anything else, the psychological challenge yep. is so great. Well, it's right? hard enough just to lose. Or right. Gain. Like it's already like, yeah. that's already one of the ch biggest challenges in your, your, your normal, you know, fat loss journey or muscle building journey is the, the psychological game. When you keep it this close, uh, it, 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 it becomes even more difficult because you don't get that feedback like you do when you're like, if you're an aggressive bulk, you know, you, you get the easy feedback where I get on the scale. I'm like, all right, I'm up another pound. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. heading the right way, right? Because yeah. that's what I'm trying to do. Or the opposite, right? Someone who wants to lose 50 or 100 pounds and they get on the scale. They're like, all right, I'm down two more pounds. So you get this feedback of, okay, I'm I'm doing really good. Where in this case, if, you know, either person, right, whether you're trying to build or or, or lose body fat, you you were following the steps that we're going to talk about right now. You could get on the scale every day for a month of being perfect That's right. and not see anything move. Yeah, well, maybe. it's almost, yeah, like you can't feed off that momentum that you would get uh, swinging hard one way or swinging hard the other way in terms of like your focus of like, what's my intent going into this? If I'm just like an aggressive bulk, like I'm smashing weights, I'm eating, you know, and it's like you're kind of fueling this momentum all in one direction instead of like really just, you know, staying in the middle and, and uh, realizing we can't go too far to one to the other. Yes. What's up, everybody? Today's giveaway is the RGB bundle. Three programs, MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, MAPS Aesthetic. Here's how you win. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this video. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If we declare you the winner, we'll let you know in the comment section. Nowhere else, okay? We're not going to send you a Snapchat or something weird. There's some people out there trying to rip people off. We'll tell you in the comment section if you won. And then boom, you got the RGB bundle for free. Now, everybody else, we got a sale going on this month. We've taken our workout programs, created three bundles to kind of meet everybody's needs. Every bundle gives you up to nine months of planned workouts, exercise demos, videos, uh, what workouts to do, exercises, reps, sets, the whole deal. Okay. Everything is planned out 
in each of these bundles, and each one is up to three. It's three hundred dollars or more of a discount. So huge discounts. Again, it's January, so it's a big month for fitness. Here's what the three bundles are. We have the new to weightlifting bundle, the body transformation bundle, and the new year extreme intensity bundle. So if you want to learn more or just sign up, click on the link at the top of the description below to find out. All right, here comes the show. So the first step, this is the most important step here with this goal, is to lift weights. The reason why you want to lift weights or do strength training is because that is the most effective, loudest muscle building type signal that you can send your body. If you do not lift weights and you attempt to build muscle and burn body fat, you're not. it's not going to happen. You may burn some body fat, but you ain't going to build muscle. Muscle does not appear on your body without a stimulus, without a reason for it, because it is expensive tissue meaning it costs your body nutrients to build and then maintain muscle. And without a good reason, your body will never add muscle to your body. And what I mean by a good reason is either a strong outside signal or a hormonal signal or some kind of a signal that says we want extra muscle. Otherwise, it ain't going to happen. So you have to, if this is your goal, if you don't lift weights, it ain't going to happen. No other form of exercise will allow you, and there's more steps, but will allow you to build muscle and burn body fat uh, like lifting weights well. Absolutely has to happen. Well, and then, okay, along those lines, the, your your second point would be the, the type of, of lifting you do, I think is really important too. Yes. Because a lot of times, especially people that are wanting to reduce body fat, um, they get caught up in the the calorie burn type of, mm -hmm. of training and get focused more on this like circuit-based, high heart rate, constantly moving, constantly sweating. And for what we're trying to accomplish here, I would say that's some of the worst ways you yes, could yeah. potentially train, right? Yep. Yeah, no, you got to focus on the loudest possible signal for muscle building exclusively. And there's a couple of those lifts, those compound lifts that really provide, you know, that uh, uh, that kind of stimulus where, you're, where your whole body is just, you know, geared in that direction towards yeah. muscle building. Yeah, so like, for example, a barbell squat in a set-to-set -set comparison to like leg extensions <clears throat> or leg curls or other leg exercises, it just builds more muscle. So it's it's a louder muscle building signal. And you want as loud of a possible, uh, as a loud as possible muscle building signal in this process. So those exercises do that. But also there's this problem. Because my calories are going to be carefully, you know, tracked or I'm cutting calories, I can't waste time and energy doing stuff that's not really going to serve me really well. You got to view your workout as the signaling for muscle and the diet as this is the fat burning part of it. Don't look at your workout as the yeah. fat burning. Although the workout does contribute to it, don't view it that way because if you start to train to burn body fat, then you're going to burn too many calories uh, or send the wrong signal, which is more of a risk actually. And then your body will actually pair muscle down. It's very common for people to go lower calorie to lose weight and simultaneously lose muscle as well as body fat. In fact, that's more common than not. Well, this is also the reason why I, during this process, I did no cardio. Yeah. And it, that's well, the most controversial part right now. It is controversial, but I mean, I love that you recently brought up, uh, that study that they just did. Yeah. And this is an example of that. If you are in a deficit and trying to lean out and you're lifting weights and you're simultaneously also doing you know, our bouts of, of cardio in your regimen, it is very difficult for you to lean out and also maintain the most amount of muscle that you that you can and that's that's why so it's like if my if i know that muscle is going to help me metabolically i know that ultimately that's the look i also want to have is i want to have a lean muscular look i don't want to be all just skinny from right. losing lots of weight then it's important that I keep as much muscle as possible in this process. And one of the ways of doing that is actually managing your deficit purely through your nutrition and your training and not through cardio. Cardio does not send a muscle building signal. Cardio sends a build endurance signal, and it also burns a lot of calories during the time that you're spent doing it. So because it doesn't send a muscle building signal and because it burns a lot of calories, the way your body adapts to it is by making you more efficient, giving you more endurance, but also making you more efficient with calorie burn. So you mm -hmm. end up losing muscle. You end up paring muscle down. Cardio will send a competing signal with the strength training. So could you lose more weight on the scale, total weight, by doing cardio plus weights plus a deficit in calories? Yes. Will you lose more fat? No. Will you build muscle? Definitely not. So remember, the goal here is to build muscle and burn body fat at the same time. And because it's such a tricky, this is such a tricky... Goldilocks zone process, 
You don't want to do anything that could potentially get your body to pare muscle down. You want to do everything yeah. in your power to try to get your body to build muscle while simultaneously eating in a calorie deficit to, to burn body fat. Yeah. And if you don't, then your body will adapt metabolically by reducing muscle. And you'll end up in, in what usually happens, which is I lost fat and I lost some muscle. Now, what is it, Sal, about walking that doesn't seem to do this? Right? Now, you so can the, walk a lot and do this, like right. tons, but yeah. if you just you know, make sure that you're active throughout the day and taking, you know, eight to 10,000, 12,000 steps a day, you're not really needing to build tons of stamina and endurance. It's really just about being active and being healthy. Right. Cardio on a cardio machine where you're going for it and you're burnt and you're sweating and you're elevating your heart workout. Rate. Yeah. Now you're looking at like, or running outside or something like that. Now you're looking at, oh, now my body really wants to become efficient. Now you can do this with walking. It's just a lot harder. You have to walk miles and miles and miles a day. To make well, that the happen. thing about walking versus um, running, jogging, all that, like it's more recovery focused. So it, it's good for overall digestion. It's good for overall circulation. And that whole circulation process, you know, aids really well with recovery, which then helps in the process of building muscle. Yes. And is that because of it, it, it because it's more recovery, um, you, you manage your heart rate relatively low. Is, is the body not receiving this kind of loud signal of endurance or push? Right? Like, whereas I get on a piece of cardio equipment, I mean, the, the, the signals are heart rates elevating, starting to sweat, lose, uh, having a hard time breathing. Like, and so yeah. I feel like the body kind of reacts. Yeah. That's uh, the environment you're presenting it. Yeah. Right, more so aggressively to, to that versus if for I'm just kind of moving throughout my day, my body's not like freaking out like, oh God, or how long are we going to be doing this for? Or this is so difficult. Oh my God, we need so much more calories. There's a, there's a big right. difference between going on a stroll, which is what we're talking about, and doing something cardiovascularly to where my body needs to improve its endurance. So I recommend you go on daily walks and strolls to where it's a walk, like you're going out with your friend and having a conversation, not like I'm out to go do a workout. Yeah. That's not what we're talking about. The workout is a strength training. That's what's going to make this It's almost happen. parasympathetic, right? Yes. Like you're, you're bringing that heart rate down, controllable, totally. and it's recovery-based. Totally. Next is, uh, so obviously you have to be in a calorie deficit to have the fat loss happen, but you don't want to be in too much of a deficit because we need to have enough nutrients and calories to fuel muscle building. So what you want to do is you want to eat in a very small deficit. So I want to ask you, Adam, when you were tracking this for yourself, what was your goal Deficit wise, you know, it, to, honestly, Sal, I actually didn't really focus so much on the deficit as much as I did like hitting my tar targets and not overeating. Got it. Right. So, because I knew through walking and my, me training and stuff like that, that I was already going to create somewhat of a, a deficit through that naturally because of the activity that I was doing and then the signal that I'm sending my body that it needs extra calories to build muscle. So I actually wanted to kind of hover around a maintenance more than I wanted a deficit. And what would naturally happen is as I built more muscle, my m metabolism would speed up, which would then would take care of, of you know, creating a, new, a yeah. new deficit. So I actually was more focused on actually hitting my macro targets, not actually restricting. I knew that as we, I built muscle, as I continued to work out in the gym and move, that I would I would slowly create that. And then what I was actually more watching was, is my weight starting to drop too fast? Oh, I need to add calories again. That's great. So it was actually like, okay, hitting a maintenance, letting the strength training build the muscle to build the metabolism. And then once the metabolism started to build enough to where I actually started to see a dip in the on the scale or see my weight going down, then I would actually increase calories. So I did more of this like staying at maintenance, slight surplus, maintenance, slight surplus process of, of actually eating but actually was leaning out. Yeah, so that's mm -hmm. great. So when I say small deficit, what I was going to say is like, you're aiming for like a 100 calorie deficit, which is probably going to come out to like maintenance. Which is exactly what's probably happening. Yes, right? yes, Obviously, yes. I was in somewhat of a deficit, but the 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 psychological or the mindset- Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. Was like, hit what my body needs. This is what, you know, this is what I've figured out is my, my caloric maintenance. This is how much protein and fats my body needs. I'm going to stay right in that zone or close to that as I possibly can. I know that if I'm just really getting started Started back into weight training, that I'm going to start lifting these weights and it's going to send a signal to build muscle. And I'm going to need that potential, maybe even surplus of calories to build. And then what will eventually happen is that I add one, two pounds of muscle, the metabolism will speed up. And then I'll start to see the scale go down or me leaning out. And then that was always my indicator of, oh, time to add more calories. That's awesome. That's mm -hmm. why the next one is to interrupt with some small calorie surpluses. Exactly what you did, right? Where mm -hmm. I would go, I would recommend someone do like five days or six days of a tiny deficit, which almost feels like maintenance. 
and then a day where you're now in a slight surplus. So 100 below, and then maybe 100 or 200 above for a day, and then back to below. And then, of course, reassessing. Because as, as you continue to reassess, if you're doing this right and gaining muscle, because at the end of your journey, your metabolism was faster. Oh, my God, yeah. yeah. No, I think when I started, <clears throat> I was eating around, I think about 2,800. And I, I don't know, I can't remember exactly, what, but I believe it was right around 2,800 to 3,000 calories was about where my maintenance was. And then by the end of this, I was over 4,000. Wow. So, and that was just, and very slowly, man, it was almost a year later. I'm so glad you said that because yeah. had you stayed at 2,800, it wouldn't have happened. Oh, definitely not. I yeah. definitely would not have built muscle. I mean, I might have slowly kind of leaned out, but if I did not, if I did not get to a place where I was eating that many calories, I would not have also added the muscle that I had mm. to speed the metabolism. Was that a psychological challenge? Because I know a lot of people that go through like that surplus mode and then they interrupt it to, you know, break it up and do like a Bro, Deficit, it was un, and they come it, right back. It was un, it was such a mind fuck, but it also was one of the coolest experiences for me for being a better coach because I I was so dialed in on where my macros needed to be that I knew I was doing the right things, right? But then there would be moments where I would get this feedback of I'd wake up in the morning and I'd look a little bloated, or I'd look like I didn't get leaner, I look like I look like I got fatter overnight or what seemed to be it felt like overnight and then i'd actually get on the scale and maybe even see the scale had gone up a pound or two wow and so it really challenged that oh my god you know do i know what i'm doing am i eating appropriate to what, I, what i'm training like and oh should i cut and what i do is like no I'm, I, I have to trust the process i have to know that i know that I'm, i've already calculated all this out I, i'm in the right place and then it would be like two or three days later all of a sudden you'd see that yeah. come out and what it was was my body just holding on to water hmm. and that little bit of holding on to water while you're also trying to lean out is such a mind fuck. and so it really opened my eyes for from a coaching perspective of God, how often does this happen to our people? Oh yeah. How often do you, you abandon say, it because of those signals? Yes. Right? And, and, and you know what, when you're, when you're in that position, this is from like the client's perspective, I don't care how smart your trainer is or how much you trust them. There's nothing they can say to you to make you feel different yeah. about what you see, because I, I, I knew what I was doing, knew it was right, but would see it. And it still messed with me. Cause I'm going like, no, I, I'm looking at this mirror right now and I know what I look like yesterday and I look worse today. Mm -hmm. Yet I trained, I ate the way I was supposed to, but I woke up. And so, you know, the the your body's ability to retain and hold water and to look a little bit different day to day uh, can be very deceiving for the, the, I mean, even the experienced person, uh, much less the, a the average yeah. person who's going through this. I like so. that. Yeah, so that's I'm so glad you said that. So basically, you're going for a small deficit most of the time, and every once in a while, you'll do a small surplus. But the key here is it's small. There's nothing massive um, in either direction. Now, along those lines, um, you definitely want to eat a very high-protein diet. One gram of protein per pound of body weight or even a little more. Yeah. Studies are pretty clear on this. When people are in a calorie deficit, but their protein intake is high, even if they don't strength train, they lose less muscle. If they strength train, they end up building more muscle. So the protein aspect is going to be very, very important. So take your body weight and say, okay, that's my goal to hit that many grams of protein per day. And that'll make a huge difference. Of all the macronutrients, that one makes the biggest difference. Well, this is so important, right? So that if I, let's say I'm hitting my calorie goal in order to quote unquote build muscle, but my protein take is so low, my body might not, right? That's right. I mean, like, so I could literally, let's say my my number is, you know, 2,900 calories is what I need, uh, I need to consume it. And I hit my 2,900, but my protein's at 30 grams or 50 grams. The likelihood that the extra weight that my body potentially holds onto or adds is not going to be that's right. It's not going to be muscle because I'm not giving it the the right macronutrients in order for it to adapt and build muscle, but I am giving it a surplus of calories. So those actual additional calories may end up getting stored as body fat. Is that right? That's it. Yeah, muscle. Your your muscles are made up of amino acids. Now there's the, the fat and carbohydrates play a role. Um, cause it's more complex than what I'm saying, but, uh, this is pretty clear. This is one of those things with diet cause diet can be murky, but this is very clear in diet that a high protein intake in a calorie deficit is phenomenal for muscle. And since we're talking about building muscle while burning body fat, like you got, you absolutely have to do this 
um, to really make this a reality, again, because it's so challenging. The next thing is we're going to talk about our carbs. Carb cycling can be really valuable during this process. Now, it's mainly because when you're looking at your total calories, especially if you're trying to be in a small uh, deficit, calories are made up of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Well, proteins and fats are essential, meaning you need to have a certain amount of each just to thrive and survive. <clears throat> carbohydrates are not essential. So when you're cutting calories, it's easier to take them from carbs because you're you're not going to take it away from, you're not taking away anything your body absolutely needs like you would from fat and proteins. Now, what is carb cycling? Carb cycling is the process of feeding yourself your carbohydrates around your workouts, for example, mm -hmm. to fuel your workouts. Usable energy. Yeah, this is, what I, energy. this is how I would like to do it, right? I like to eat my carbohydrates a couple hours before my workout so I have the fuel during the workout to fuel the strength building, muscle building process. And then maybe the rest of the day, my carbohydrates are lower because my calories are, are lower uh, overall. That's one of the main ways. That so when I did this... Um, the way it ended up working out was like my medium carb day was basically caloric maintenance. My low carb day was a deficit. And then my high uh, carb day was a slight surplus. So proteins and fats are almost the same. That's right. Proteins okay. and fats are the same. Carbs is what I manipulated. The carbohydrates also was what had me undulate my calories. Mm -hmm. And so I found that's another reason why I really liked it. Was it, it was an easy way to actually do that and just by following these macros mm -hmm. and i'd have these days where i'd get this uh, this the uh, carb surplus obviously love those days because i'm eating additional calories uh that would fuel these great workouts i also tried and scheduled the big like leg day training stuff that i would do uh right around that so i had this extra energy from it that would put me in a surplus hopefully my body is building and adding muscle from the surplus of calories then i go back down to a, a a maintenance day and then i'd have this low and i actually cite like and there's different by the way there's different ways to carb cycle i play with all of them i used to run two low days a medium day and then a high day mm. So that's kind of like what mine ended up looking like. Well, I like this too with the manipulating the carbs specifically because then on the low days too, you're still like satiated when you are high protein. Yeah. And that for me was like so much more manageable. My hunger signal didn't get too loud and, and I wasn't fighting that as much. Yeah. Totally. Next up is to prioritize sleep. Here's why. Probably the most effective way to build fat and burn muscle or lose muscle is to have crappy sleep. Losing sleep is a tremendous stress on the body. And evolutionarily speaking, if you weren't getting enough sleep, it was probably because you had to look for food. It's probably because food was scarce. Otherwise, your body, I mean, we need sleep. We absolutely need sleep. Uh, sleep would have been uh, you know, ruled out a long time ago if it wasn't absolutely a necessity because you're unconscious for however many hours of the night making yourself quite vulnerable. So it's something that you need. And if you're not getting it, through most of human evolution, it probably meant like we weren't getting, I wasn't getting enough food. I need to be up trying to find more food. So because of that stress, your body tries to slow its metabolism down. It's like, okay, well, we, we can't find food probably. Let's reduce our metabolic rate. And one of the best ways to do that is to pare muscle down. Also, let's hold on to some insurance because body fat is insurance. More body fat means you can survive with less food for longer. So your body actually, what it does when you lose sleep is it modifies its hormone profile to get rid of muscle and to burn, uh, to build body fat. It also will change your cravings to do so. You'll notice after one night of poor sleep, you crave foods, you have uh, more of a sweet tooth, more palatable foods or things that you want, both because they make you feel better, but also because your body's trying to get you to eat more because of that stress. So poor sleep will kill this 100%. You got to yeah. prioritize it. I can't help but think uh, and refer back to when we were speculating about uh, why all these bodybuilders were just getting massive and um, they would go to that place in the Middle East. Yes. Um, and we thought that maybe there's some crazy myostatin they're on oh, or whatever. Yeah. But really, they kept the feedback was that, you know, yes, you know, some they're on anabolics, but really what, what, transcended their physique was the fact they're so regimented with their sleep yeah. and they're so regimented with their nutrition and it's like completely scheduled and dialed in there with no interruption oh is it would you say it's fair to say that um getting good sleep is one of the best ways to naturally potentially um optimize your hormones and yes. getting poor sleep 
is one of the easiest ways for you to disrupt your hormonal balance. So fast. One night of bad sleep will change your hormone profile. So when you think about the role that hormones play in building muscle and fat loss and energy and all these things, and when you understand that, right, that plays a key role, right, to you being able to build muscle or lose body fat, and then you understand that sleep is one of the, the easiest ways to improve that and one of the easiest ways to disrupt that, you start to realize like, oh, wow, like if I'm not thinking about that as a one of my key priorities in really balancing this whole diet, lifting, training thing out, mm -hmm. I'm missing out on one of the biggest things that could impact my results, right? Completely, 100%. This has got to be a big, when I say prioritize, we mean like every day. Not like, yeah, Monday through Thursday, and then Friday and I go to bed late, wake up late Saturday, so I have jet lag, and then Sunday, and then... No, no, no. Prioritize means every single night, because even one or two nights of really bad sleep um, will wreak havoc on this particular goal. So this has to be as prioritized as the consistency that you're lifting weights or the consistency with your diet. It's literally up there with being just as important, if not more important, because bad sleep will affect you yeah. negatively more. No room for error. Then, yeah, then, 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 poor, like you could have one bad day of eating. It will not negatively impact you as much as one bad night uh, of sleep. Well, I think it, you brought this up, right? And I don't remember if you were referring to someone else talking to you about it or your, your own research was that when you have, like, let's say you have like perfect, you go to bed at 9 30 yeah. every night, Monday through Friday, but then Saturday, you're out at the club till two in the morning or what that. It's like literally like you're jet lagged it for is. the next two days trying to get that circadian rhythm back to normal. It again. is a three or four hour difference when you travel puts you in jet lag, right? Two hour difference will put you in a little bit of jet lag. Well, that's what people do every week. Every week they go to bed at a certain time and then Friday night or Saturday night comes, they go to bed late and they say, well, I'll sleep in the next day to make up for it. Well, you make up for, for a little bit, but what you're really doing is you're you're messing with your circadian rhythm. Monday comes around. That's why everybody hates Monday. Yeah. Monday comes around. Got to get back on schedule. Why do I feel like dog shit? Well, it's like you came from a, you, like you're traveling. You came from another country yeah. and you're behind by three or four hours. And it takes two or three days just to catch up. And that definitely messes with your hormones. So this has to be like seven days a week. Uh, next up. Now, this is one of the least important things, but uh, this can help a little bit. And there are some supplements that can help with this process of building muscle and burning body fat. Really what these supplements do more than the fat burning is just the building muscle. Mm. Fat burning supplements, you can pretty much throw them in the garbage. <laughs> um, there really isn't anything out there that burns body fat. Some supplements out there might, might suppress your appetite for a bit, which can help. But really what you're looking at are muscle building supplements. And the number one muscle building supplement that's out there that's been tested thousands of times is creatine. Mm -hmm. And studies show when people diet and take creatine versus diet and don't take creatine, they keep more muscle. Now, the one thing I will add to that, though, is this, is supplementing for areas where you're deficient can be incredibly oh, impactful. Yeah, good point. For example, nutrient deficiencies, right? magnesium was life-changing for me for getting better sleep. Yeah. Like, and we talk about how important sleep is. Learning that I was, uh, you know, deficient in magnesium and then taking the mellow every single night made a huge impact on my sleep. Vitamin D, vitamin right? D, if you're somebody who's very, for me. very low on vitamin D. So, so I think at the point your Sal's making is that, you know, all these fat burner, muscle building, you know, gimmicky type of performance supplements that are out there are really worth nothing in this pursuit. But what has value is your your overall balance of nutrients that your body actually needs to be functioning. Yeah, right? that's a great point. I didn't even mm -hmm. think of that. Yeah, if, if you get uh, like a test to see if you have any nutrient deficiencies and you find any of them, that'll be a game changer because essential nutrients are essential for functions of the body, including hormone production, you know, fat loss, muscle building, health, immune system, pretty much everything. So if your vitamin D level is low, if your magnesium is low, if, if there's a, a iron is low, supplementing with those can definitely be a game changer. Now, on top of that, supplements like creatine can help because creatine is very, very pro-muscle and indirectly anti-fat because of the muscle building process. Another supplement that helps is hydroxymethylbutyrate, known as HMB. This is uh, closely related to um, leucine. It is a... a, a, a some, it's not an amino acid, but it re resembles an amino acid, and it is pro-muscle sparing. In fact, they now put HMB in um, meal replacement shakes in like uh, those retirement homes to prevent muscle wasting for older people. It's actually quite well studied. It's nothing groundbreaking. You're not going to take HMB and notice, but it may help you 
or prevent you from losing muscle if you start to mess up the, the calorie balance a little bit. And then branched amino acids can kind of do the same thing. Although I will say this, if your protein's high enough, yeah, then it's pretty irrelevant the value of, of branched amino acids in HMB starts to decline. Creatine's still valuable, but those two, uh, not so much. Yeah. Now, the last step, this is important because as Adam was explaining, this is like a, this is a constantly changing process. At the beginning of his fat loss, muscle building, stay the same weight journey, his, his metabolism was 2,800 or 2,900 calories. At the end, it was 4,000 calories. The only way to know how that's working for you is if you test your body fat percentage weekly, gauge your process on a weekly basis, then you know what levers to pull, right? Then you know if the calories are too high. Ooh, I gained muscle, but I also gained body fat. So let me drop the calories a little bit. Or, ooh, I lost body fat, no muscle. In fact, I lost a little muscle. Let me raise the calories a little bit. This is a touchy process every single week because if you are building muscle and burning body fat, metabolism is changing. I mean, your diet has to change uh, as well. So this was the rule that I came up for myself. It was, I tested every week. I took pictures every week. Same time, same day. Fr Fridays, first thing in the morning, always. But I would not adjust anything in my programming until two weeks. So I, ne no matter what oh, happened, good point. so I never, whether I, if I didn't like what I was seeing or I thought my progress had stalled, um, I, I never made a correction to the plan that I had set out until two, a good two weeks. And it was just what I had found. Cause you're looking for a trend, right? That's right. I, yeah. I needed, I need a, a week is not quite enough when you're talking about how slow the body builds muscle and burns body fat. Um, a, a week isn't quite enough for me to get enough analytics to make a real educated decision on which way I could go. And ease, and you guys know from body fat testing, you know, they can be off a little bit. And so a little bit up or a little bit down and just in seven days could really throw me off on, on overcorrecting. So I would always, uh, I would still track every week, but I wouldn't make corrections and changes in the nutrition and the training until two weeks it. And then I, then I could be a little more objective, like, okay, here's my pictures two weeks ago. Here's my pictures to now. Here's where my body fat percentage was two weeks ago. Here it is now like, okay, now let's, let's make a decision based off of that versus every single. Yeah. Week. The part that you said is real important is that you body fat tests aren't, I mean, it's impossible yeah, for them to be not totally, perfect. No, this could be user error. If it's electronic impedance, I mean, then you have even more factors that can make it inaccurate. So let's say, you did a body fat test and it went up a half percent, which is like, I mean, statistically you could error up to one or 2%, right? You probably shouldn't change anything. Now, if you go the next week, it's up another half percent. Well, okay, now I know. But if it's back down, you're like, okay, it was obviously a mistake. Which is why I also like to pair it with the pictures because sometimes what might've happened is I didn't see much body fat change, but then I would see my pictures. I'm like, oh, I, I, I like the direction I'm going. Yeah. I can see... In that two weeks, like I'm making improvements. Oh, I see my shoulders are coming out a little more. I see my waistline's coming in a little bit. Like, okay, I like what I'm seeing. And even though the body fat percentage isn't showing me anything super positive, it's not negative. And what I see, I like, I'm going to stay the course. So, or vice versa could happen, right? You could be like, oh yeah, I think the, the pictures look terrible I'm, or they look the same from two weeks ago. But then, oh wow, when I do my reading, it says I'm right on course with my body fat percentage. So, you know, stay the course. So, I think using both of them to make kind of an objective decision around like, you know, so because I think the biggest mistake that people make when you're trying to do something in the, like the Goldilocks zone is, is to uh, make a, a decision too soon. Uh, mm -hmm. That's, yeah. that's too drastic. Patience and, is so important with this. Yeah. Thing. You have your, and you're bet like, it's not going to kill you if you're, if you're kind of stalled and you're not seeing the progress you'd like to see doing another week or two, staying right there, it's not going to hurt you. And what I found more often than not was trusting that process and staying right there for another two weeks. The next two weeks I made big leaps. Kind of weird how the body works like yeah. that. Like it's kind of like how we talk about how kids grow right. when they're, when they're little, it's like, yeah. it's not like they grew three in, uh, three There's inches some resistance there. Your body yeah, well, like sometimes they'll have like no growth, right? You yeah. remember it's the, all they, spurts. Yeah. And then also there's a spurt where like, and the, I felt the same way about the, 100%. The, the pursuit of building muscle and losing body fat is like, you know, sometimes I'd have just not a great week, but my eating was perfect. My training was perfect, but mm -hmm. then the results were kind of, but then the next week comes and it was like, Oh wow. I felt like I made a big leap. It was like a release. Yeah. So I would always err on the side of, 
hey, I can stick this out for another two weeks to give it to, a, a chance to show me the results. So versus, oh man, I didn't move very much this week. Oh, drop calories more or oh, pick up this. And yeah. it's like, when I did that, I felt like I always ended up overcorrecting. So when you're in this process and you you feel stalled, don't, you know, test it for another week or two. It's not going to hurt you to stay at those calories, to stay consistent with the way you're training for two more weeks to give your body the opportunity to take one of those leaps. Because then what you might find is then the next two you're weeks- You're on the right track. You're like, oh, wow, this was great. Love you know? it. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 